In today's video, we'll take a look at three cases where a person was killed by someone who was hiding in their closet. But before that, we want to bring you a word from our friends and the sponsors of this video, Magellan TV. Lately, I've been binge watching the series Weird or What, which is hosted by the incomparable William Shatner. Magellan TV has two seasons of this fascinating series that looks at some of the strangest stories from around the world. Besides Weird or What, Magellan TV has thousands of other documentaries. Some of the documentaries are available in 4K, and they are as stunning as they are interesting. Magellan TV is run by filmmakers, and new documentaries are being added all the time, so there's always something to watch. Magellan TV can be watched anywhere, at any time, on your TV, laptop, or mobile device. It works with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS, and you can even cast from your phone to your TV. Magellan TV has a special offer for criminally listed viewers. Just go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed and you'll get a month for free. So please help support criminally listed and find something interesting to watch by checking out Magellan TV. Number 3. Saya Suzuki Mitaka, Japan is a densely populated city that is part of the Tokyo metropolitan area. In July 2011, one of the city's residents was Saya Suzuki. She was 16 years old. In that July, she met a 19-year-old man named Charles Thomas Ikenaga on Facebook. Ikenaga lived in Kyoto, which is 280 miles from Mitaka. A few months later, in December 2011, Suzuki and Ikenaga started dating. The relationship lasted for about nine months. In the autumn of 2011, Suzuki broke it off. Ikenaga wanted to stay together. So he made several attempts at reconciliation. But Suzuki had no desire to get back together. Soon, Iganaga was harassing and stalking Suzuki. Suzuki did a lot to distance herself from her ex-boyfriend. This included blocking his phone number and blocking him on social media. But he still found ways to harass her. He also threatened to kill her. On October 6 and 7, 2013, Ikenaga made several posts on Facebook. They were links to nude photos that Suzuki had taken for Ikenaga. On October 8, 2013, over a year after they broke up, Suzuki went to the police and told them that she was afraid of her ex-boyfriend. An official report was filed and the police planned on talking to Ikenaga. Suzuki arrived home from the police station at about 4.30 p.m. She called the police and told them she had arrived home safely. Her conversation with the police officer lasted for about 20 minutes. Hours earlier, Iganaga had entered Suzuki's home through an unlocked window. Once he was inside, he hid in a closet. When Ikenaga heard 18-year-old Saya Suzuki end her phone call, he emerged from the closet. He was armed with a knife that had a blade that was nearly half a foot long. 22-year-old Charles Thomas Ikenaga stabbed Suzuki in the stomach and in one of her arms. She managed to get out of her home through the front door. But unfortunately, she was not fast enough to get away from her ex-boyfriend. Iganaga stabbed her three more times, including a lethal stab to the throat. He then got up and ran away from the crime scene. A witness saw the attack and she called for help. Saya Suzuki was taken to the hospital, but the 18-year-old did not survive her injuries. Iganaga was arrested about an hour and a half after the attack. Once he was in custody, he confessed to the murder. 
On his computer, the police found a checklist he used to prepare for the murder, which included buying the knife. He had also figured out a budget for traveling to Mitaka. In July 2014, Charles Thomas Ikanaga pleaded guilty to murder. He was sentenced to 22 years of prison. Number 2. Gloria Dawn Collins In the spring of 1967, Gloria Dawn Collins was 27 years old. She lived in Port Moody, which is a city in Metro Vancouver, British Columbia. Gloria worked as a secretary to the president of a distillery in Vancouver. Gloria's father, Ted Collins, was a well-known jazz pianist. Gloria was well-liked and she had many friends. She had dated several men, but she did not have a steady boyfriend. In April 1967, Gloria traveled to Fullerton, California for a vacation. She was staying in the apartment of some family friends. The apartment was on the ground floor of the building. When Gloria was in Fullerton, she made several friends. Gloria was planning on flying home on March 5, 1967. On March 3rd, a farewell party was held at the apartment. Thirteen guests came to the party. After the last guest left at around 3 a.m., Gloria got ready for bed. She then went into the bedroom that she had been using during her vacation. It's believed that a man, possibly a party guest, was hiding in the closet and they crept out and attacked Gloria. The next morning, at around 8.30 a.m., 27-year-old Gloria Don Collins was found dead. Initially, the police thought she had been stabbed to death. That was because her neck and her torso had suffered dozens of stab wounds. But the medical examiner said that the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. She had been struck in the head with an unidentified heavy object. Also, the instrument used to stab her was unusual. It had two prongs, so it was something like a meat fork. She had been stabbed 26 times, but since the weapon had two prongs, she had 52 stab wounds. Neither murder weapon was at the crime scene, and they have never been found. It did not appear that she had been sexually assaulted. The police thought that the killer tried to either convince Gloria to have sex with him, or he tried to rape her. Something went wrong, so he snapped and killed Gloria. 36 hours after the discovery of the body, the police arrested 25-year-old William Thomas Blakeman. Blakeman was also from the Vancouver area. He had lived in Vancouver up until about six months before the murder. He had moved to Seattle, Washington because he got a job with a company that manufactured scientific instruments. Blakeman had come to Fullerton a couple weeks before the murder because he was doing some training at his company's head office. Blakeman did not know Gloria before the party. The police interrogated Blakeman for about 11 hours. He was sketchy about his alibi for the time of the murder. After Blakeman was arrested, the police collected the shoes and the clothes he was wearing on the night of the party. The crime lab found a drop of blood on one of his shoes. They also found some more blood in the weave of his sweater. The crime lab tested the blood for type. The blood found on the sweater and the shoe were the same blood type as Gloria. In the days after Blakeman was arrested, a woman named Ruby Tweedy got in contact with the police. Tweedy explained that around the time Gloria was killed, she was driving past the apartment building. Suddenly, a young man appeared out of nowhere 
and forced her to stop her car. He got into her car and he threatened her with what she thought was a knife. Queenie said that the man forced her to drive home. When they got to her home, he forced her inside and he sexually assaulted her. After he was done, he left without further harming her. The police did not think that it was possible that there was two violent offenders in the same area at the same time. They concluded that the man who killed Gloria also stopped Tweedy and kidnapped her. Tweedy was able to identify her attacker. She said it was William Blakeman. Ruby Tweedy testified at Blakeman's preliminary trial, which happened just over a week after he was arrested. Blakeman ended up being indicted for first-degree murder for the killing of Gloria Collins. He was also indicted for sexual perversion and crimes against nature for the attack on Ruby Tweedy. However, before Blakeman's trial, the judge ruled that there was no evidence that Gloria's death was an act of first-degree murder. So Blakeman was ordered to go to trial for second-degree murder. Also, the charges regarding the attack on Ruby Tweedy were dropped. After testifying in the preliminary hearing, Tweedy went missing. The police believe that she chose to leave the area. What is known is that William Blakeman did not physically kill her. Blakeman had been denied bond and he had been in jail since his arrest the day after Gloria's murder. But before the trial started, someone else came forward and accused Blakeman of a horrifying crime. When Blakeman was arrested for Gloria's murder, it made headlines in Seattle, which is where Blakeman had lived in the six months before the murder. Seattle resident Mary Wood read about Gloria's murder and she immediately recognized Blakeman from a photo that was included in the story. Mary lived in an apartment in Seattle with her 12-year-old daughter, Cecilia Wood. On February 9, 1967, about three weeks before Gloria was murdered, Mary had her friend over, 26-year-old Carol Gornell. Gornell stayed over that night and she was sleeping in the same room as Mary's daughter, Cecilia. In the middle of the night, Mary was awoken by some strange sounds coming from her daughter's bedroom. She went into the bedroom and she saw a man kneeling beside one of the beds. The man noticed her at the door and he stalked towards her with a knife. Mary said she pleaded with the man not to hurt her. Mary said that they stared at each other eye to eye for a few minutes. Then the man lowered his knife and walked past her. He left the apartment and Mary locked the door behind him. She then attended to her daughter and her friend. They had both been stabbed multiple times and they were struck with a heavy object. Cecilia had been stabbed three times. One stab wound punctured her lung. Cornell had been stabbed 27 times in the head and the chest. Both Cecilia and Gornell survived their attack, but they were not able to identify their attacker. Mary did get a good look at him, and she was sure that the attacker was William Blakeman. Even though Blakeman had never been convicted of the brutal assault, let alone charged in connection with the stabbings, Mary and detectives from Seattle were able to testify about the attack at Blakeman's murder trial. The evidence against Blakeman was mostly circumstantial. The most damning evidence was the blood that was found on his shoes and his sweater. The blood that was found was the same type as Gloria's blood type. Also, there were fibers found on Blakeman's clothing that appeared to have come from Gloria's bed. The district attorney argued that the odds that all the circumstantial evidence connecting one person to the murder was astronomical. 
If the jury combined all the circumstantial evidence with the fact that Blakeman was the prime suspect in a similar set of stabbings, then they should conclude that he was guilty. Blakeman's lawyer pointed out that Blakeman had never been charged with the stabbing of Cecilia Wood and Carol Gornell. Blakeman also had an explanation for some of the most damning circumstantial evidence. Notably, Blakeman could explain the blood. The blood that was found on his sweater wasn't visible to the naked eye. It was found in the weave of the sweater after a closer inspection by the crime lab. There was also a drop of blood on one of his shoes. Blakeman had a girlfriend and she was prone to nosebleeds. His girlfriend had the same blood type as Gloria. So the blood could have gone onto his sweater and his shoe from one of her nosebleeds. Also, Blakeman was at the party on the night of the murder, so he could have easily gotten the fibers from her bed on his clothes from just attending the party. Nine fingerprints were found inside the bedroom where Gloria was murdered. Now the fingerprints matched Blakeman. The car in the home of Ruby Tweedy was also dusted for prints. None of the fingerprints that were found matched Blakeman either. A witness who went to the party testified that Blakeman left the party with her and her husband. They went back to her home and Blakeman was sleeping on the couch at the time of the murder. Blakeman's trial lasted for six and a half weeks. The jury deliberated for two and a half days. Besides second degree murder, Blakeman could have also been found guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter. He was ultimately found not guilty of all charges. After Blakeman was acquitted, he said he planned to return to Seattle and go back to work. He also said he planned on marrying his girlfriend. There is no record of Blakeman being charged in connection with the stabbings of Cecilia Wood and Carol Gornell. What happened to William Blakeman after the trial is unknown, as is his current whereabouts. The murder of Gloria Don Collins is officially unsolved. Number 1. Patricia Knuckles Hector Black was born in 1925 in Queens, New York. During his first year of college, he was drafted into the army to serve in World War II. Hector was a Quaker and he had no desire to see combat. The Quaker religion is a denomination of Protestantism. Hector served in the army for two years, but he stayed off the battlefield during his entire stint in the military. Hector's time in the army affirmed for him that he was a pacifist. After the war, he devoted his life to peace. Hector attended Harvard and he graduated with a degree in social anthropology. After university, Hector Black traveled to Belgium. He worked with a group of Quakers who were improving mining conditions in a town. After that, he rode around Europe on his bicycle, doing odd jobs. He then traveled to Paraguay, where he lived with a pacifist group. He stayed there for a bit, and then returned to New York State. In New York, he lived on a Hutterite commune. The Hutterian Brethren is a religion that has a branch of Anabaptism. Two other major branches of Anabaptists are the Amish and the Mennonites. Unlike the Amish, Hutterites use modern technology. They have electricity in their homes and they drive modern cars. Often, they use state-of-the-art farming equipment. They have a strong focus on rural communal living. While Hector was living in the commune, there was an exchange with a Hutterite commune in South Dakota. Hector was one of the people who went to live in South Dakota. 
It was there that he met Susie Mandel, who was 11 years younger than him. He was one of 14 children in a Hooderite family. They got married and went on to have three daughters together. In the mid-1960s, the Black family was living in New York State. While they were living there, Hector went to a talk that was given by famed civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer. Hector was deeply moved by the talk. In February 1965, Hector and Susie moved to Atlanta, Georgia. They settled into a predominantly black neighborhood called Vine City. Hector got a job with an inner city tutoring program that was run by the Quakers. During his work, Hector realized that many of the children's problems stem from their home lives. So Hector started working around his neighborhood by fixing up the living conditions of some of the homes. In February 1966, Hector was arrested after he organized a rent strike against a slumlord. While he was sitting in jail, a group of people protested outside the jail. Leading the protests were Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife, Greta Scott King. Hector was released after about 36 hours. After Hector was released, he continued to work in his community. When the Black family moved to Atlanta, they met a young girl named Patricia Ann Knuckles. Patricia was eight years old when she first met the Black family in 1965. Patricia's father wasn't in the picture. Her mother was an alcoholic who often drank away the rent money. Hector would help Patricia's family financially when he could. Patricia and her younger sister would stay with a black family when their mother wasn't around or sober. In 1968, Hector bought a farm that was about 50 miles outside of Atlanta. When the family moved, Patricia moved with them. From then onward, with the permission of her mother, Patricia lived with the Black family. Hector and Susie raised Patricia like she was their own daughter. A few years later, they relocated to Nashville, Tennessee. Patricia was a bright young woman. She graduated from Fisk University in Nashville and then she went to Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, where she got her master's in library science. After she finished her master's, she got a job with the Atlanta Public Library. In her free time, Patricia volunteered with an inner city ministry. She did several things with the ministry. This included helping the homeless. Another one of her jobs was picking up people and bringing them to the ministry so they could get a four-hour bus ride out to a prison so they could visit loved ones who were incarcerated. Ivan Simpson was born in a mental hospital in Atlanta, Georgia in 1965. Simpson's mother had been diagnosed with schizophrenic tendencies and she also abused substances. When Simpson was 11 years old, his mother took him, his brother, and his sister to a pool in Atlanta. His mother had been told by God to destroy her children. She ended up drowning Simpson's sister while he and his brother watched. Simpson and his brother escaped. Afterward, they were put into foster care. Over the next few years, Simpson's brother sexually assaulted him regularly. Eventually, all of Simpson's siblings were diagnosed with schizophrenic tendencies. When Simpson was 18, he became addicted to crack cocaine. When he was 27, he managed to get clean. He got a job in a kitchen, and he also got an apartment. Simpson remained clean for four years. The one day in 1996, Simpson won $80 on a lottery ticket. He decided to buy some crack cocaine to celebrate. 
Soon enough, Simpson was using again regularly. Over the next four years, he lost everything. To feed his habit, he would break into homes and steal anything valuable. In November 2000, Patricia Knuckles was 43 years old and she was living alone in a house in Atlanta. On the evening of November 20th, 2000, Patricia wasn't home. Ivan Simpson broke into Patricia's home by breaking a window at the back of the house. He stole her TV and VCR and exchanged them for crack. An hour later, Simpson was back in Patricia's neighborhood. He noticed that her house was dark, so he decided to let himself back into the home. Minutes after he got into the house, Patricia arrived home. Simpson hid in a closet. But then Patricia opened the door and she was startled to see a strange man in her closet. Simpson attacked Patricia and tied her up. He then picked up her car keys. As Simpson was leaving, Patricia told him to get help with his drug addiction. He responded by telling her to get burglar bars and to leave a light on when she left her home. Simpson then drove off in Patricia's car. He assumed that she would be able to free herself and call the police. But about an hour after Simpson left, he was cruising Patricia's neighborhood. He noticed that her house was still dark and no police were around. He parked the car and he entered Patricia's home for the third time that night. Patricia was still tied up. Simpson asked Patricia if she would have sex with him. She said he would have to kill her first. So that is precisely what Simpson did. He strangled Patricia to death and then he had sex with her body. The next day, when Patricia didn't come into work, one of her co-workers called the police. 43-year-old Patricia Knuckles' body was found in the hallway of her home. A fingerprint found at the crime scene links Simpson to the crime. He had been arrested several times for burglary, so the police has prints on file. Hector and Susie were devastated by the loss of their adopted daughter. Hector wanted to hate Simpson, but that bothered him. Hector was a practicing Quaker who had dedicated his life to peace. The district attorney was planning on seeking the death penalty. Hector was against capital punishment, and he pleaded with the district attorney to not seek the death penalty. In January 2002, Ivan Simpson pleaded guilty to murdering Patricia Knuckles. At the sentencing hearing, Hector testified. He started off by saying, although Patricia was not our child by any claims of birth, she was our child by every claim of love. Hector said that Patricia had been part of their family for 35 years and he was proud of the woman his daughter became. He also addressed Patricia's killer directly by saying, I don't hate you, Ivan Simpson, but I hate with all my soul what you did to my daughter. He then went on to say, love seeks healing, peace, and wholeness. Hatred can never overcome hatred. Love is the light. It is that candle that cannot be extinguished by all the darkness in the world. Finally, Hector turned to the judge and said, my wish from my heart is that all of us who have been so terribly wounded by this murder, including you, Ivan Christopher Simpson, is that God would grant us peace. While Hector testified, he and Simpson locked eyes. When they did, Simpson started crying. Then the judge sentenced Ivan Simpson to life in prison without the chance of parole. Before Simpson was led away, he twice apologized to Hector and the rest of Patricia's family who was present at the trial. That night, Hector said it felt like he could breathe a little bit easier. 
That was because he knew he had forgiven Simpson. After the sentencing hearing, Hector wrote to Simpson and told him that he had forgiven him. Simpson wrote back and apologized to Hector again. This was the start of a correspondence between the two men that lasted for years. Every few weeks, Hector and Ivan would exchange letters. Hector also got Simpson a subscription to National Geographic. Two years after the murder, Simpson said that he knew that God had forgiven him and Hector had forgiven him, but he will probably never be able to forgive himself. He said he has accepted that he is going to die in prison and he has tried to make the best life for himself possible by being a model inmate. In the years after the conviction, Hector and Susie gave public speeches and they worked on abolishing the death penalty. At the time of this video, Hector, who is 95, and Susie, who is 84, live on a planned nursery near Cookville, Tennessee. 55-year-old Ivan Simpson is serving a sentence at the Ware State Prison in Waycross, Georgia. If you just watched this video, you're probably interested in true crime. Sadly, true crime has a hidden cost, and that is real people have lost their lives, and in some cases, perpetrators escape justice. But you can help make a difference. If you join Magellan TV in July, Magellan TV will donate $10 to the Cold Case Foundation. The Cold Case Foundation raises awareness about cold cases, and they provide resources to law enforcement agencies who are investigating cold cases. So please help support this great foundation and get access to thousands of documentaries in the process by checking out Magellan TV. Just click on the link in the description box below this video. Thank you so much for watching today's video. If you're looking for something new to watch, why not check out my new channel, Chapter Dark. Every week we have a new mystery for you to solve. In this week's video, you are trying to solve the mysterious disappearance of a young woman. Is her disappearance somehow connected to a serial killer known as the Closet Monster? You can find a link to Chapter Dark in the description box below this video. But well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.